I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, I, I was asked to um, speak about Ignatius's um, examine in particular. I thought I would just say a word about Ignatian prayer to put the examine into context um, with Ignatian prayer. Um, all of you know that um, Ignatius wrote this book called The Spiritual Exercises. Um, he wrote it based on his own experience. He went through hell, basically, if you know the story. But his own going through hell and um, moving from uh, being touched by God in his conversion experience to going through hell, to coming out of hell, to um, an appropriation of how much God loved him um, in his own uh, soul and his own life, which included his own sinfulness. And the, the great grace of the first week, of course, is to know that you're a sinner, but you're a loved sinner. And that's what he learned through the cave of Manresa, that, yeah, I'm a sinner, but uh, I'm loved. I'm, uh, deeper than sin is love. Deeper than any errors that we do is grace. Um, and he uh, learned that and so embodied it and so wedded it to scriptures. I mean, he, he knew... He got to know the scriptures very well. It's one thing to to have scriptures and you know kind of know where things are, and kind of read them for uh, uh, the lessons that they teach. It's a whole other thing to um, have scripture read you, and that's what one of the Ignatian prayer forms is about. Um, uh, Ignatius had these texts read him. They started to take flesh in him. Now that so that whole process comes out, and he um, then starts to journal, uh, keep his notes, and to create a journal, and to create this little book that became known as the Spiritual Exercises. But it's it's wrought through his own experience. Um, it's not an interesting read. Um, it's not usually recommended for nightstands <laughs> because it's more like a recipe book or a how-to book, so it's kind of rather boring. Any of you that have used it know that, um, and yet it's been a gem in the Catholic Christian tradition um, and in for all of Christians, uh, not just for Catholic Christians. It's a great resource for um, deepening one's personal relationship with God. Um, that's what that text is all about. So all those boring instructions and how-to and the preludes and the colloquies and all of that is really about um, a process by which one can um, meaningfully and with some pattern of relationship and a dynamic movement come closer and closer to God. And that's what that book is about. Now, in the spiritual exercises and in his own life, um, Ignatius um, kind of summarizes, historically, um, summarizes many prayer forms that antedate him. They predate Ignatius, so he really can't take credit for them. Um, and can't really take credit for the examine, quite frankly, because that, I mean, you could say that uh, Pythagoras and other people, the Greeks were doing a form of examination of their thinking. That, that's not entirely new, um, and it's not entirely just Christian. It's uh, in Greek philosophy. <laughs> um, so Ignatius often gets credit for things um, that, that um, he, if he were sitting in that chair, would probably say, um, well, thanks a lot. But it really, you know, exactly. I, I was summarizing through my own life uh, many streams of how to pray and many um, a lot of wisdom um, about prayer. And so the prayer forms that I'm going to put up here on the board are not necessarily Ignatian. He, he um, used these prayer forms and in some ways refined them, um, broadcast them, developed them in the spiritual exercises. The specific one that we're going to look at today, because I was asked to talk about it, is the examine. But um, taking the broad perspective, um, there are a fair, uh, quite a few prayer forms that emerge from the spiritual exercises. And let's put the um, awareness examine here. Uh, these are five big prayer forms, I guess you would say. I'm sure that there are more. Um, someone said that there are 30 or 40 prayer forms in the exercises if you count, count them all and dissect them all. but. Um, uh, we'll talk about number one this morning and actually experience it. 
Um, Lexio Divina predates Ignatius. Lexio Divina is a Latin phrase that means sacred reading of the text. To take the Bible um, and to use it for the purpose not of um, just what are the instructions here, but to use the text so that um, it starts to take flesh in me, as I said. And to um, you do a sacred reading of a, of a text is to uh, you know sit sit or um, uh, in a, usually in a sitting uh, posture, start some breathing exercises to focus oneself to um, decide sometimes in advance which text you're going to use. Um, as you get to know scripture, know your way around scripture, or there are actually manuals or books that will instruct you in Lexio Divina, and you only take a section of the text and slowly read through the text. Now, some people like to read through the whole text that they're going to meditate on or contemplate, read it all through once, and then go back and start to slowly read the text and to stop when a phrase or a word is starting to move my heart. That's my language for that, is the text is starting to read me. I'm reading the text, but the text is really starting to read my life. If I go through a text and there's a phrase or a word that is really starting to move, then you can even just kind of close the book and put it down and leave it in your lap. Now you are in, the text is doing what it's supposed to do, creating the relationship between you and God. That's all, this is a means to an end. It's not the end in itself in this kind of prayer. So Lexio Divina, or sacred reading of the text, can be um, discerned or uh, delineated in two ways. Meditation, which typically, again, this is in Ignatius, but in, in the uh, Catholic Christian tradition, med meditation typically is understood as um, discursive prayer. That's the language that you'll see in the old textbooks. Uh, it creates a dialogue, a dis discourse between me and God. Some phrase, some idea, or the, the, the action that has taken place if I'm meditating on Jesus healing a blind man, I can ask the question, how am I blind? When I ask the question, how am I blind, I'm beginning to speak to Jesus. Jesus, this is where I, you know, you, you heal this guy, but this is how I feel, I'm blind. Um, and you may go over that history. Where did this start? Where did this blindness start? Um, or it could be the other way around. Jesus uh, encountering someone that he um, loves, like Zacchaeus, the little guy up the tree. Um, and Zacchaeus, come down, I need to spend time in your home. And you may get into that reading and just see the delight that it was in uh, Zacchaeus uh, about Jesus coming into his home. And then the, then the meditation might be, um, yeah, you've been in my life a long time, Jesus. I just love you being there, <laughs> you know. Um, um, come, come into my life. Uh, here are the things that I want to share with you, Jesus. You're creating a dialogue. It's a discourse. It's discursive prayer. Um, in this Lexio Divina kind of prayer, then, um, what typically occurs is rapid. This is much more, compared to the uh, other forms below it, this tends to be more rational. It's the rational faculty. Um, here's what the text says. Here's how it applies to my life. Here's the lesson <laughs> for me. Um, so Lexia Divina meditation typically um, accenting the rational faculty. Um, this prayer is often very important in uh, the life of discernment, when I'm discerning my life, when I'm discerning an action, when I'm discerning a choice between things. Um, often using Lexio Divina meditation really helps a conversation with Jesus that says, yeah, this, this has been a good prayer session because it's kind of gotten me back to the values that I know that you have and that I have, and so I think this is the direction that I need to move. Now that's a pretty rational engagement with the text. Lexio Divina imaginative contemplation is the one up there on the board that I think probably Ignatius could get a, a, most credit for. It's usually celebrated. When people talk about Ignatian prayer, sometimes they mean number three. That this is a sacred reading of the text, and um, what Ignatius asks people to do is to do an application of the senses. In the exercises, there are um, instructions at, at this point um, where in a narrative section of 
scripture, and it typically has to pretty much be a narrative section of the Old Testament or New Testament, meaning uh, the narration is that he, uh, you know, this here's this person, this person met this person, and they traveled on a road together, and they, you, you would have a hard time doing this with Proverbs or, or um, with Leviticus, you know, uh, all the laws in Leviticus, so it would be hard to be do a magic to contemplation with that. But in um, those sections of the Old Testament, Moses and the burning bush, Isaiah, uh, six, Isaiah goes into the temple and he has a mystical experience of holy, 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 Lord, I am not worthy, the burning ember on the top of the lips, uh, etc. Where there's actual narrative stuff and certainly all that gospel material. You know, Jesus was on the road and he met, um, you know, the woman uh, who had the hemorrhage and she had this hemorrhage. She was sick for 21 years or whatever the text says. You know, all of those kind of sections, Ignatius says, apply your senses. Create the place Compose the scene, the composition of place is a technical term. Compose yourself first, where are you? Situate yourself in this scene and create the scene. What do you see? What do you touch? What do you taste? What do you feel? Uh, what time of day is it? Is the hot sun on your back? Uh, look at Jesus uh, and the woman at the well. You know, uh, look at, you might be a bystander uh, and you're, you're listening in on this dialogue. What look does Jesus have on his face? What look does she have on her face when he says to her, I see that you've had five husbands, you know? <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, become involved imaginatively in the scene and the imagination opens up the richness of the text. And so here, um, you're not only using the rational faculty, but you're also adding certainly the affective. And I'm not making strict distinctions saying that the affect never enters here uh, or you know, vice versa. But this, this kind of prayer certainly um, goes much deeper and much richer into the whole rich feeling of affect. And it's an education in affect, actually an education in our affective life because it gets us in touch with joy, with sorrow, with desire. Um, in the spiritual life, uh, what do we desire for these people? What do we desire for Jesus? Um, what do I desire for myself as a result of seeing this kind of interaction between him and the Samaritan woman at the well? Um, uh, does Jesus turn to me and say, okay, Steve, I see that you've had five. Metaphorically, what I see that, what does he see in me? He saw this in her when Jesus looks my way, but I'm sure I want to go like this, you know, because I don't want it. And all of this data, Ignatius says, if you do shy away from Jesus' gaze, what is that saying? <laughs> you know, all of this is important data. Um, can you look at Jesus? Can Jesus look at you? And can, does Jesus have, uh, uh, you know, the freedom to say, you know, Steve, I see that this is going on in your life. Can we talk about this? You know? <laughs> so what the text has done is I've gotten off the page, but I've gotten deeply into the reality of that narrative. That narrative now now, stays, now starts to take flesh in me. It's not the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus is done with her, and now he looks over at me. I see you've been sitting over there, Steve. Hi, you know, um, who are you? You know, um, can we have a dialogue now that's similar to this? Well, now again, the text is reading me. The text in a profound way is reading me, but it's not just what lesson do I get out of this text. It's like, it's much more existential now. It's really touching very deep chords of my life, of my history, my temperament, my talent, the things I've done, the things I would like to do, my own desires um, are ri richly combed when I do this kind of prayer. Contemplation, in the strictest sense, is um, certainly non-discursive. Prayer, to use that old language from the manuals on prayer. This prayer is really non-discursive. Um, sometimes it's inspired by an image or an idea, and you may in the literature have seen the term um, then, um, uh, These are Greek terms, and you may run into them in prayer manuals. Um, non-discursive prayer, that's prayer that is certainly 
moving in a direction that's not rational, it's not about discourse, but I can still be holding an image. I can still be holding an idea. Sometimes it's just, let, let's take that John 4 text, the Samaritan woman at the well. It's developed that he, I saw the interaction with them, and now I go to a, an imaginative prayer the next time, and now it's me. I'm the Samaritan woman, and he's talking to Steve. Okay, So now it's become deeply personal. In that interaction, I may just find myself looking into his eyes, just gazing at him. I may find myself, at, as a result of something that I've heard him say or that I've said to him, I may just pause for a moment and just abide in the presence of the one who is the source of destiny of my life, Jesus. I may just find myself calmly and quietly enjoying the silence of it all. Now, there may be an image or an idea there that we've shared, and if there is, that's called cataphatic prayer. Uh, if there's no images and ideas, there's kind of a radical emptiness, a radical nothingness. Some people pray that way. Um, they pray in a in a way that is um, their most their the air that some people breathe or the the geography of the soul that some people have. If that image works for you, imagine a landscape of your soul. Uh, for some people, there, there's images and ideas and people on that, and that's cataphatic. Apo means empty. APO in Greek means empty, not fullness. Kata means full of, uh, roughly. A apophatic means empty of. Um, some people pray that way, and in contempl contemplative prayer, then, um, it can be the apophatic mode or the cataphatic mode, but basically in contemplative prayer, um, I stop having to work hard. <laughs> it's like God takes over more and more. And so I may start doing Lexio Divina meditation and find, you know, have the Bible in my lap and I'm doing my meditation. And I may find that one phrase or one word or idea immediately has moved me into the presence of God and I don't even need to think anymore. I am just touched by a deep abiding sense of the presence of God. Now with some people that becomes habitual and we call them contemplatives, that for some people, they don't have to work so hard at prayer anymore. When they go to prayer, it's like God just kind of takes over. Mm -hmm. Now think of this, um, lest this sound too disincarnate. Any of you who have been in love know that there are certainly times where there's a lot of yakking, and a lot of talking, and sometimes <laughs> argue, ar arguing, and et cetera, back and forth. But you also know that there are times where just you take her hand across the table and you look into her eyes vice versa, right? There are these moments where there's just an abiding sense of love and presence, and you don't need to say a lot. Uh, holding somebody, you know, those gestures, which can become sexual, but the, the gestures of love are wordless. They're contemplative in that sense. Um, to, to hold someone that you love and to just say nothing in the deep sense of reverence and love and all, all of that. And people say, well, that can happen in prayer. I say, oh, sure it can. <laughs> Why would we settle for anything less? Why would we not want to hold God? Why would God not want to hold us in that way? So this is now contemplation. And in the, in the exercises, Ignatius will, will say, this will occur. Um, I love, um, at the beginning of the spiritual exercises, there are 20 notes. And they're called annotations. And they're just notes for the director. Um, the 19th note uh, is called, uh, uh, g uh, gives the instruction to the director, if the person cannot do the complete exercises in 30 days, give the exercises in 30 weeks. Ignatius lived in the Renaissance, and if you know the Renaissance was the burgeoning of trade and commerce and culture, so the very apt people are out of the castles, out of the feudal system. Now this is a burgeoning world. Ignatius knew very well what we know is that it's very rare for people to be able to take 30 days out of their lives, but you can do the complete exercises in 30 weeks. That has come to be known as the spiritual exercises in everyday life, but also it's its other name is the 19th annotation retreat for the simple reason of the 20 notes it's the 19th note um, and that's Ignatius's note that if you can't do the complete ex if you want to do the complete exercises and you can do them in 30 days or in 30 weeks well um, 
that's a long uh, <laughs> introduction to make the point I wanted to, which is that number two, um, to make my point about contemplation, I love what Ignatius says here. He's saying this to the director. Remember, this is a manual for the director, not for the directee, not for the person making the retreat. Ignatius says, um, it is not the multiplicity of ideas that satisfies the soul. It's the inner taste of things like that. And what he's saying to the director is, uh, this book, this spiritual exercises book, dear director, is filled with details. It's filled with all kinds of ideas and instructions. But basically, I'm telling you at note number two, when your directee, when the person sitting before you is starting to taste God, get out of the way. You don't need more ideas. That person may not need more readings. You may want to assign a repetition of that. If there's a certain reading uh, in the exercises and the person's heart and soul is really moved and he's really meeting the God who's holding him or her, you know, you might want to assign a repetition of that reading until that feeling is exhausted. It's the inner taste of things that satisfies the soul. Now that's a cue, I think, to what Ignatius understands by contemplation. It's not the multiplicity of ideas, which would be more meditation. And there's nothing wrong. This is an important prayer. This is a very good prayer, especially, I think, when people are in the midst of discernment. You, there are times where you want a more rational instruction or lesson because I got a decision I need to make here. I don't want to get lost in, you know, love. And isn't that true in, in, a, in a human relationship? Yeah. There are times when you need to move along. You got, you got to move along and get things done. There's time for uh, holding and there's time for taking action thinking. So, but that, I think I'm correct that this would be how Ignatius would understand contemplation is that it's the, in, when you're tasting God, is there's a sound, taste and see how good the Lord is, you know. So, when that's happening and you just abide, contemplation is just abide in it. it and this becomes much more simplified, much less busy, and the person herself or himself starts to feel uh, prayer more, if this becomes habitual, prayer is becoming a little easier because I don't have to do a lot. I just need to show up. I, I need to make myself present. And this love is starting to go back and forth. Finally, um, colloquy is a very common prayer in the spiritual exercises. Ignatius assigns a colloquy, again, this in this very detailed outlay that he's got in the spiritual exercises, he assigns colloquies, meaning at the end of a prayer period, you may have done a, a meditation on uh, Luke 5, where Peter meets Jesus for the first time. Uh, Peter's been working all day long. Um, he's got the boat in and he's starting to take the nets in. This guy Jesus walks by. He's kind of heard of this guy Jesus and knows that he's a holy man, that he's a rabbi. And this holy rabbi says, put out to water again. And what do you mean put out to water again? We just took it all in. Okay, you're a holy person. So, you know. Well, they go out and they catch this huge draft of fish, right? Um, and uh, then Peter says, depart from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. I may have just spent a whole lot of time meditating on that kind of text. And on a retreat, not only will you have done one text, but if you do make the complete exercises, or an eight-day retreat that is scripturally based, or the 19th annotation retreat, you may have three or four readings a day and make a colloquy at the end of the day. And colloquy simply means, simply means have a conversation. Now that you've done this day of prayer, or they had this experience of prayer, just talk. Uh, sometimes Ignatius will say, talk to Mary. Uh, talk to the Trinity, talk to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Uh, just have a conversation. Well, many people will tell me that they're, that they're, one of their main styles of prayer really is I, I just talk with God. I just create quiet in the room and I just imagine uh, Jesus sitting in a, prayer, a chair and I have a conversation with Jesus. So this is another prayer form in the text of the exercise. Again, Ignatius didn't, obviously didn't invent that. Um, that's, a, that's Jesus had colloquies with his father. I mean, they had conversations. And soon you can see that in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, among other places. So these are prayer forms. Um, before I move into the, uh, what I was asked to do was to talk about the examine, but um, any questions about this outlay? Okay. Nope. So the examine. Just, just yeah. make the point that these. As many of you know, 
all these prayer forms are in the Karis retreats in you know some form or other. Not all of them are in every retreat, but this is what runs through all the retreats. So just to good. I'm I, I'm new to Karis, so these these are yeah, clear. Anyway. Yeah. These are used yeah. often <clears throat> by you uh, in, in the Karis retreats. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. And Not so much the colloquy, but I mean th that one. I would say is the least used, but the others, were, you know, and the right. and the contemplation. I mean, there's, you know, anyway, that would be more if people silence. experience that in their own silence. But the examine and both of the lexio and the, you know, so there is like I think our Jesus retreat has a colloquy with Jesus on the cross, like yes. an image, you know. So yeah. that's a key colloquy. Um, in in the spiritual exercises of Ignatius, there's a lot of scripture in it. He actually assigns you to read the nativity section of the, of the Gospels, to read, you know, um, temptations in the desert, to, you know, you move through the life of Jesus. But he also has these key structural pieces that he himself wrote, and one of them is the colloquy under the cross, what have I done, what am I doing, what ought, ought I to do for Jesus? And that's a, um, that's a point at which one could have conversation um, with God, and that's a kind of a structured colloquy within the exercises. Well, the examine um, has been um, talked about a lot. Uh, did you guys get the copy of Rummaging? Yes. Poor yes. God. I might refer to this. Yeah. Um, got it in there. This is an article that appeared in American Magazine by um, Dennis Ham. It's become a mini classic. It kind of appears all over the place, and uh, your use of it in Paris. So. Kind of Rummaging for God, Praying Backward Through Your Day by Dennis Ham. It's a double cider. Appeared first in America magazine and it's been published elsewhere. Um, uh, the examine has been referred to with different language. Uh, a number of you probably know this, that have worked with this tradition of the examine. Um, it's been called a consciousness examine, awareness examine. Uh, examination of conscience has problems, and we'll talk about that. It's way too low. Um, I kind of like the AE awareness examine because I think one of the things um, that it do that examine does is um, makes one aware. Awareness is important, um, and I would say owns the capacity to notice um, one of the great gifts of this prayer um, the other thing of, of course that we just you know, put right here is its simplicity these are kind of characteristics These characteristics It's a simple prayer form. And under this, I guess I would put, can be done anywhere. You don't have to have your Bible, which you pretty much do with Lexio Divina, or your computer <laughs> now. You need your, your electronic device, which you downloaded the whole Bible on, so you can access it through an electronic device. But um, this is a simple prayer form that can be done in the car, you know, um, in the bathroom. <laughs> you know, where it, can, it just really can be, it can be done anywhere because it's really a 10 minute prayer. It's simple, it's short. I think number one, though, um, makes one aware, and here I might imagine that some of the stuff that you talked about yesterday might, might come here, um, uh, Mark, I, you know, I, I don't know what with now covers or, or what you talked with IT and stuff, but I just think people today are so rushed, you know, um, we all are crazy, and um, I say, you know, we're having experiences all the time, but I don't know that we experience our experience. And what an awful way to go through life, having some really fine experiences, um, and we don't experience our experience sometimes. Unless we consciously take the time every day, and this is a daily, this is just a daily, so it's a daily prayer. Um, the manuals often say twice a day. Um, Ham, I think, says at least once a day, and I think he says at the end of the day is what he suggests, but there's no 
know, you, equation here that everybody has to follow. But it is uh, suggested <laughs> daily. Um, the regularity of it, um, I'll mention after we do after you the practice. It regularly practiced. If you don't really practice this regularly, the effect of it is not going to be helpful. I don't. I don't think. Unless you're doing it this way, I suppose maybe someone who said, you know, I have other prayer forms that I like and I don't find the exam that helpful. Um, some people um, might want to do this monthly um, or yearly, an annual, the annual review. <laughs> How did the year go? And that's basically an exam. You know, where was God in the year? Where was God in the month? Um, so I don't, saying daily prayer, it's usually practice daily. But um, there's no reason why one couldn't make it a monthly exercise. Say, every wouldn't it be nice to put in my schedule every fourth Saturday of the month, I'm going to take an hour out on Saturday morning for me and I. And what I'm going to do at the beginning of that is do an assessment. Where was God in this month? And I'm going to keep a journal. <coughs> and uh, there on the other board, too. I'm going to journal that. And um, at the end of the year, I'll have 12 little paragraphs about how the year went and at the end of the year I'll read those 11 paragraphs and write the 12th one and here's 2012. You know. <laughs> so examine 2012. Uh, there are all kind of variations on this but I think they all do number one. The whole point of this is to make us aware. The, cultivate the ability to notice what is happening in my life and in my experience. Um, because so many of us are driven by so many things, um, a real problem in prayer for many people is distraction. We can get easily distracted by life, by responsibilities, and I don't know about you, but I, I, I could have a whole running commentary about why I can't pray today. The, the, the excuses come easily enough uh, about why I can't pray today. Jesus, you know, and um, Jesus being as loving as he is can work with that. But um, I think this is uh, very important. And um, the other thing that I would add here is um, what you're noticing. What am I noticing? How did I write it here? say God, God's action, God's working in the concrete circumstances of my life. Examine is pretty much incarnate prayer. It's grounded in the actual experiences of my day. That's the intention that Ignatius had about it. It's in the concrete circumstances of my life uh, that God appears. God's lack of presence, God's action. One could also say God's absence because certainly when I do this kind of prayer, I'm also starting to notice where God wasn't um, and maybe why God wasn't there. You know, so it's, it's a both and. But um, So what capacity to notice, I guess you could say what, and point number four is the capacity to notice God in the concrete circumstances of my life. And to do that in a very rather compact, short, quick way um, maybe an, an analogy is um, um, all of us do this, and I, certainly my undergrad students at John Carroll, and I talked to her for 14 years at the end of that, and I see the Loyola students doing it more and more because everybody has handheld devices now. And this new generation, unlike generation, I lose track of them, I think it was generation X or Y, was not talking to their parents because they were alienated from them, but this generation is really into their parents, and so they're always checking in, hi, ma, and they're walking along the street, and you get the, the other phenomenon of the helicopter parents who match their attention by hovering, right? That's, isn't that part of the analysis? So, um, so there's a, a point being that what a want to bring from that is that checking in. People are always checking in. Well, examine might be thought of as that. It's checking in with God. You know, I'm checking in with everybody else on these devices. Do I take the time of my day to check in with God? You think that theists, Christian theists, would make that a regular part of their practice. But we have all kinds of excuses by why we can't do that. And what this prayer is suggesting is at least saying, here might be an easier way 
it might be difficult to do a good half hour of Lexio Divina every day, and if you set that bar, you're probably going to be disappointed and feel like God is disappointed in you, because there are people who just can't do that. Certainly an hour of prayer, you know, meet people on a retreat, and the retreat was such a great, now I'm going to go out and pray an hour a day, and I'm saying, no, you're not. I just know you're not. I mean, we can do that. You know, that'd be nice. And if you can do it, great, you know. But, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I do the examine um, six days of the week, and that's my steady diet of prayers that I really have a sac sacrosanct time, morning, noon, or evening. People are different that way. Hannah, I think, talks about it in the evening. I have an examine prayer, and on Saturday morning or on Sunday morning, I have time to do Lexio Divina. So I work up my own pattern or my own diet of prayer, knowing the many rich prayer forms. I start to set, I start to set up my own <coughs> prayer schedule in my life, and actually plan how I'm going to relate to God. But this this one is the good one that uh, can be used daily and um, in everyday life because it's. Um, uh, pretty handy uh, prayer that can be done anywhere uh, for this kind of daily checking in and noticing where was God in this day? How is God working in my life? And the other thing would be to say, I put it up there, so I'll put it here, um, um, can start to notice patterns. If I do this regularly, and it won't be helpful if I don't, can start to notice patterns of what? God's presence and absence. Where's God likely to be present in my life? Oh, I notice every time I do this or every time I go to this place, some people discover holy places. Do you all have holy places? Hopefully you do. Where are places where you can pray? And some people know that I can really pray if I go here, and I, you know, I can't pray when I go here. Uh, those kind of patterns. Where am I apt to find God in my life? And where am I consistently not finding God in my life? What are the kind of things that I do that consistently bring God present to me? What are the kind of things I do that I know takes me away from God? Ignatius started to notice this in his life, and he called that, what are the patterns of consolation? Meaning, just quite simply meaning, where is God present? What are the patterns of desolation? Where does God seem to be absent? How am I participating in creating one or the other? <laughs> because this is about a relationship. So it is God, but it's also it's the divine subject, but it's also the human subject. How am I participating in creating consolation so God can relate to me and be present to me? And how am I participating and cooperating with my own desolation? And those are the things that I want to work against. Again, the work against is that you're the cars people learning Ignatius, Ignatius lingo, Ignatian lingo, adjure contra. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So you, you know, you speak, you speak Ignatian. Adjure <laughs> contra means to work against it. When I start to notice the patterns of what's taking me away from God, and this is, you know, people are getting paid thousands of dollars in board rooms and 12 step programs to come in as experts of, of what? Adjure contra. I'm going to teach you how to work against the patterns of addiction. You know, I mean, this is. Uh, no surprise that a Jesuit was at the founding of uh, AA because some of the some of these kind of principles of doing exam daily examinations for them daily confessions I have a problem you know um, this kind of methodology nation methodology is used in a number of 12 step programs um, and there was a Jesuit who was at the founding of uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and I've forgotten his name right now but. Um, so, um, some basic points here, um, and uh, looking at your ham article, and then we're going to actually do the exercise. Pam, uh, I have an hour and a half. So, is that? Okay, we'll, we'll be fine. Um, look, looking at your ham article, go with me to the second. The clock is not oh, oh, so where are we? What time is it? It's a quarter to ten. ten. It's a quarter to ten? Okay, that's close. <laughs> that doesn't work. Don't turn the gym hat. It's a quarter to ten, so we've, we've done an hour. Yeah, so you got like another half. Yeah, we're fine. Um, so looking at the middle column and at the bottom of the middle column, um, are we together the phrase, if today you hear his voice? Okay. So come into that. Um, uh, he makes an important point. This implies that the divine voice must somehow be accessible in our daily experience. 
today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts, okay? For we are creatures who live one day at a time. If God wants to communicate with us, it has to happen in the course of a 24-hour day. That seems pretty logical, okay? For we live in no other time. And how do we go about this kind of listening? How do we listen if God is... The presumption here, there's a theology here, and he's writing a simple article, so he's not going into the theology of this. But the theology of prayer at all, including the examined prayer, is that we have a God who is a self-communicating entity. It's using a little bit of Karl Rahner, R-A-H-N-E-R, is a, a theologian of note from the 21st, uh, 20th 20th century, died in the 80s. Uh, Rahner likes that phrase, it's translating from German. What, what can we say about God? Who or what is God? And Rahner would say, God, whatever God is, is a self-communicating entity. And we get that from the Judeo-Christian tradition. You get the sense throughout the Bible, Hebrew scriptures and Christian scriptures, of a God who's passionately trying to communicate to people. <laughs> you know, and uh, as I say, you know, first he tried covenants. Abraham, you know, a covenant with Noah, a covenant with Moses. Uh, he tried the law. He tried God, he, she, it, uh, <laughs> God, God, this great mystery. Tried uh, the law, tried uh, kings. Okay, I'll give you kings. You people want kings, I'll finally, I'll give you. They didn't want to go that way, but I'll give you kings. And then the kings were corrupt. And so what, what does God send next? Against the king. Prophet. Prophet. Okay, I'll try prophets, you know, and then one day God, in God's mind, <clears throat> this is anthropomorphizing, said, It's not working, what should we do next? The Trinity is saying, you know, Send Jesus. one of us will take flesh, and then they'll see us. They, they can't miss us then, right? I'll take flesh, what a great concept, you know. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, the incarnation happens. How, how can they miss me? And, uh, are still missing God, and that's part of the problem, uh, is that God came and uh, gave this revelation. So the idea here throughout the Old Testament and New Testament is a self-communicating God. Whatever it is that God is, in the Judeo-Christian revelation, God wants to be known. So we just assume that theologically, and that's what I think is being assumed in this sentence. Um, how do we uh, go about this kind of, if God wants to communicate with us, it has to happen in a 24-hour period. Behind that is a self-communicating God. And what are we, uh, Rahner, in one of his phrases anyway, would say, we are hearers of the word. So if, the, if this is a self-communicating God, and that's the divine subject over here in this column, the human subject, looking at the divine subject, we are hearers of the word. And so how do I hear? Well, if I'm never listening, if I'm never planning to listen, I'm kind of stiff-arming God, you know, yeah, I can't, I'll get to, you know, I'll get to you, you know, sometime. And the days go by, and the weeks go by, and maybe sometimes the months go by, and I have not taken time to listen to this one that I say is the most important thing in my life, if I'm a theist, committed theist. So this prayer is a simple way to get it going, to have 10 minutes of your blessed day where you become a hearer a listener, a noticer, if you like that word better. I'm noticing where were you today, okay? Um, so uh, he goes on to say, um, he calls this rummaging around like rummaging through a drawer, like, you know, you reach in the drawer, and you're maybe reaching in the dark a little bit Tinkering. to find things, you know, tinkering, <laughs> you know, and where is God? Uh, rummaging backward through your day, where was God? Now this is great because it's about noticing, it's about going back over the day and tasting the day. Where was it really good? This was, this was the good part of the day, and maybe also at the same time, where was it not so good? It didn't taste so good. It's about noticing. It's about tasting. It's about being aware. It's about experiencing my experience. <laughs> really experiencing my life. Because some of us are going, years are going by, and we're not experiencing our lives. So. Uh, so rummaging around, feeling around. Then in the next column, the examine or examination of conscience is an ancient practice in the church. In fact, even before Christianity, the Pythagoreans and the Stoics promoted a version of this practice. So again, Ignatius did not invent this. It's just that the way he put it in the exercises and the use he made of it, I think, is pretty stellar in, in, in Christian tradition. I think it often gets focused on Ignatius, but we have to humbly admit it. Ignatius would be the first one to probably say, well, thanks a lot, but I didn't invent that. 
Um, so even uh, the Greeks had a form of this. Uh, Catholics uh, are familiar with this. Those of you who are Catholic are familiar with this because uh, this was preparation for confession. Um, maybe the youngest people in the room don't know the phrase examination of conscience that you did before you walked into a confession of the sacrament of penance. Uh, but we need to make it very clear that that's not what this is, really. And for the reasons that he gives in the next paragraph, um, uh, Ignatius does have a review of the Ten Commandments. It's a salutary thing to do, but it wears thin as a lifelong daily practice. It's hard to motivate yourself to keep searching your experience for how you sin. In recent decades, spiritual writers have worked with the implication that conscience in Romance languages like French and Spanish means more than the English word conscience. If you know Spanish, conciencia does not just mean moral conscience, what did I do right and wrong, it's consciousness, it means a lot more than that, uh, than our English con conscience word means in the sense of moral awareness and judgment, it also means consciousness. Now prayer that deals with the full content of your consciousness lets you cast your net much more broadly than prayer that limits itself to the contents of conscience or moral awareness, and George Asher Brenner really talks about that. And then at the bottom paragraph he says, in my way of doing this, I'm really gonna focus on feelings. Um, some people have found this rich in Ham's approach, is that it's not just a review of the day, but because so many of us are not in touch with our feelings, because we get emotionally numbed by so many things, his suggestion at step, in his step uh, four, no, three and four, uh, you know, review the feelings that are going on and then focus on one of those feelings, positive or negative. And this then becomes an education of affect. Um, so we might add that here too, that one of the characteristics is um, an education of affect. And this gets into, uh, again, I like the word tasting. You know, what, I'm tasting my life, you know. Um, and then I, the other thing that I would also put here is uh, Ignatius was very big on desire. Um, there was a there was a whole way, and you, if one studies the history of Christian spirituality, there was a whole way in which desire was seen as the opposite of spirituality. You were supposed to put to death your desires to be holy. And Ignatius stands as a representative, along with uh, many others, but uh, Bernardo Clairvaux and a whole bunch of other people who are uh, very much celebrated the human affect at prayer. Ignatius would say, "No, desires are great." You know, the, the education of our desires, the education of our affect, so that we can do what? Order our loves. You know, and that's why this prayer in conjunction with discernment, which I've got at number three over there, this prayer is actually a way of doing ongoing discernment. Because if I'm actually doing exam and saying, where was God present, where was God absent, here's how I'm finding God in my life, and doing that every day, and these patterns are emerging, I'm discerning my life. And in this education of one's thought and one's affect, I think there also emerges um, a sense of how do I order my loves? You know, and I say my loves because uh, I don't want to order either. Healthy human beings know good and bad from bad. So we're not dealing with the bad. The struggle that most of us had is there's so many good things to do. It's like, how do I give order to that, to all the possibilities and the good things that I can do? One way of doing that is to keep staying with where am I finding God present to me? Where am I finding God present to me? And uh, where is God very richly speaking to me and where am I very richly speaking to God and to check in with that every day and to see those patterns emerging and um, order order my loves um, uh, along the lines of discernment. So for the next 10 minutes, I'd like you to get in a comfortable position. But can and I ask one quick question yeah, before sure. we do it? You have on here the social world dimension and um, last weekend Pam and I were at the Jesuit Collaboratives Finding God in Unsettled Times and I left pondering the question of how do you present the exam and teach the exam in a way that it's not so self-reflective and doesn't hit, doesn't call people beyond. 
Because yeah. um, I think so often, as I've taught people the examine, you know, via Karis and just other things, that it ends up being very much like a me-centered prayer. And so, do you have any insight on that? If you even wording on how to kind of yeah. share when you're when we're initially teaching this to people. Yeah. Um, just everywhere that you can keep adding the words and the world and the society along with the personal pronoun or the personal reference. Okay. I think that's that may sound simplistic but I actually think it works is that when you give instructions on anything or even yourself when you're doing uh, Luxio Divina prayer you know and it is you and God and he has looked at you the whole thing I created there with the Samaritan woman and now it's he's speaking to Steve to to have a colloquy at the end of that kind of a prayer where if it hasn't happened in the actual experience mm -hmm. of God as I move out of that to say what are the implications of this not only for my life but for the world and for what I do. I think we just simply need to ask the question. We should always add that reference to our prayer to make sure that our prayer and this education of affect and mind that's happening is also starting to take on this whole other wing of, okay, what are the implications of this for the people that I, people that I touch mm -hmm. in various circles of as they ripple out. So it may be nothing more or less than just simply to keep adding those um, the reference. Yeah. 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 Isn't there Please. something, Steve, in the exercises where Ignatius talks about, um, I think maybe it's having to do with consolation or deep desire, but like re recognizing like authentic um, experience of God in that it like it's something that moves me out into the world, not something that like closes me off. So well, here's the thing. I think the whole the whole dynamic of the spiritual exercise is, is that it moves um, from um, the personal to the social. I think by its very nature, that if you make the complete exercises in some form, because certainly you start out uh, with meditations on the goodness of creation. That's social and cosmic. Even. You start out, you kind of start out cosmic, and then if you know the structuring of the exercises, the phrase contemplation to obtain love, it's one of the structural pieces that Ignatius himself wrote and put into the exercises. It's one of the last contemplations at the end. You're back saying, where does this go out into the world? Because one of the major steps of the contemplation to obtain love is how God continues to labor. There's still all this work to do that the Creator God who created, worked and created in the beginning. And when I did my first meditations, when I started this 30-day retreat, and I was just seeing myself as part of God's wonderful creation, now at the end with the contemplation to obtain love, I'm seeing God is continuing to labor. That, that same Creator God is continuing to labor. And throughout the retreat, He has said, God has said to me, um, do you want to join me in this? Mm. That has social dimensions. Yeah. It's not just about you being the loved sinner. That's clearly a grace of week one. And if I'm going to be, but yeah. being the loved sinner, being graced, being redeemed, being cherished, being held by God is all for a much bigger purpose. And that bigger purpose is to join the mission. That's called the election in week two. Again, this is all technical terms of those of you that don't have uh, knowledge of the exercises. Um, the exercises have four weeks, week one, two, three, and four. They're not chronological weeks. Usually week one is about a five-day period for a lot of people. Week two, often nine or ten days. Week three, again, maybe four or five days, and then week uh, four, uh, week three, four or five days, and then the final one, maybe again, four or five days, and those are the 30 days. So it's not chronological. It's about what's happening in the person. That uh, When is the grace given in each of these weeks so the director and the directee do not move into the next week until the grace of the previous week actually has been given? But um, all of that is to say that at the end of week two is this thing called the election. And in that movement um, of my life, I am, not, I am the loved sinner in week one. In week two, I start to meditate on Jesus. I haven't done any meditations really much on Jesus in the first week. Now I start the nativity, the temptations in the desert, the baptism. As I start to really see Jesus and put on the mind of Jesus, and if I'm using imaginative contemplation, you know, the richness and the grace of the second week is that it's not what's happening in me in the second week. It's what's happening in him. And the beauty of that, you know, what's happening in my friend? 
what's happening in this one that I love when his townspeople want to throw him out of town. It's not what's the lesson for my life in that as much as just saying, boy, Jesus, that was really tough for you, wasn't it? You know, I'm starting to see into him. There's a social dimension even in that, that right. the meditations are about what's, it's not just what's happening with me. That's important you know, when I take journal notes, when I make it every two, but what's happening in Jesus, you know, during, during week two, what's going on in him? And then in week three, when you get into the passion, again, yeah, what's going on in me becomes an important question, but it's also what's going on in him and the love that I have for him. That's the grace. See, so you see the social dimension here is that it's not just focused on me, it's focused on Jesus. And what is he so sad about? He's sad about what's happening in the world. About the injustices that he's dying for. You know, the, the way we treat one another, the way we sin, you know, here's our sin in a whole new way, you know, by week three. So I think uh, the thrust and dynamic of the exercise is, is to make a choice that I want to be part of this. And that usually in the dynamic of the exercise it happens a little bit in week one, in the transition between week one and week two when I'm doing this contemplation, what have I done for Christ, what ought I to do? Christ, etc. But then when you work through week two and you're really just focusing on Jesus and his own public ministry, it inevitably comes up like well, if you're meditating on the, and then he chose 12, you know, and you're imagining I'm one of the 12, you know, he chose me. Well, what did he choose you for? Do you want to be part of this work or not? Any of you know the meditation on the two standards? The two standards is another structural piece of the exercise. All of these exercises move the dynamic along in a way that this love that we now feel so deeply for one another has social consequences. It's meant to go out. It's not meant to be this private reserve. So uh, I think a way to do it is to always, um, you know, at least add it to the, to the process. Um, and to add it to my own repertoire, that whenever I'm doing any kind of prayer, as a, if not in the moment itself, because I don't want to interrupt God's grace, if God really wants to communicate something to me, I don't want to interrupt that, but certainly moving away from the experience in the colloquy kind of section, what are the implications of this now for how I do what I do? Well, then I'm making it social. What are the implications of this for the world? What are the implications of this for our budget? Someone said a budget is a moral document. I've looked at all this stuff with Jesus. What implications is it for what's happening in Washington? Do I want to elect for the president? I mean, this is, there should be profound connections here in this material um, to what's happening in our world today. Okay, um, so let's uh, do the exercise. In the, the next 10 minutes, get comfortable. I will take you through a version of the exam, and then we'll just uh, Talk about it. And I think what I have to do here is that I have to ask you to think, um, you might want to think about just what happened since you woke up, but maybe what we need to do is uh, in the last 24 hours. So think about yesterday. <laughs> okay. And we um, did do one starting out, just so you know. You did? Yeah, like we, so we're like uh, 24 hours on. Okay. Maybe 20, 20 hours ago we did. That. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So uh, something that, that Mark said or something that happened yesterday might be that you can extend your time frame to yesterday, in other words, if you want. Now, maybe you already had rich experiences this morning, and that's where you're proud. That's entirely up to you. Okay. So I will do this. Uh, please get in a comfortable position uh, for the next 10 minutes. Give thanks to God for God's gifts. God's gifts to you, to our country, to the world.
What are you grateful for? Especially in the last 24 hours. Ask God for light. Ask for the light to be near you. all around you. Even to fill you. Ask God, Jesus, Spirit, to look together with you at the last day. Now, review the day. What persons, words, ideas, actions, brought God to you. What does God want you to see about your day?
focus on one feeling from yesterday or this morning. What does that feeling tell me about myself? Or about God? Or about our world? What am I grateful for, sad about, or concerned about now, then? Or in love with? Finally, ask God for what you want for the rest of today or for tomorrow.
felt to me like it was roughly 10 minutes. And that's what this is. That's the exam. It's a form of the exam, and I used good parts of ham there. Um, uh, talk, uh, any conversation? Uh, does someone want to say what they experienced during that? Is that I think it would be wonderful for the CARES retreats <laughs> yeah. to have a recording of this. We have a video now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, I mean, to be guided through it is, I think, is really very helpful. And for beginners. And sister, this is using the technology. <laughs> this is using the technology. This isn't right, the right. team doing it. It's using the technology that all of a sudden they're going, oh, let me pay attention. Father asked me to close my eyes. Boom, you know, and it's not Father, it's the screen. It's the tinkering. YouTube. Yeah, but I YouTube, think, mm -hmm. yes. But I think that yeah. also it's something that needs to be done with a team formation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, In yeah. other words, yeah. that uh, yeah. Yeah. the Absolutely. team needs to own it and practice it mm -hmm. so they can share it. Uh -huh. yeah. Because, yeah. you know, unless you do it, <laughs> you cannot teach it, you know. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, we have like almost three months of team formation. And so if at every meeting we do it as a, you know, as a regular prayer form plus the others, right. it, it would work. You know, you know Pam, you could put that on your website with your video. So daily, if I wanted to click. <laughs> mm -hmm. and there are yes. only several yeah. video versions of it. Yeah, there. they are. Yeah. It's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. yeah, and in there, your packets. Uh, I believe they already got it right. The simple life changing prayer book. Yes. Yeah. So in the right. from yesterday, there's the Jim Manning's version right. of the simple life changing prayer, which is just a great. And he and Jim Manning also on. Um, I think it's on IgnatianSpiritually.com has a version that's online that you can, it's called the Lunchtime Examen. And it'll do, it's got, you know, like a pretty backdrop and some music and it'll say, now move on, um, yeah. which on would be one. Yeah, it's in yeah, I think it's on IgnatianSpiritually.com. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Also, but you know what we should do? Uh, and pray as you go. We should, we should find some of those resources that you can yeah. just go to make sure everybody gets that term. Yeah, we can <laughs> Like, I have something that's interested in it, and kind of like a teaser. So yeah. We'll try this. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Another piece is that, you know, like, you know, you guys that are married or in community, you know, it's something to do in community with your wife, with your kids and family. I mean, it's, it's applicable to many situations. Like I said, if it doesn't fit within that 24 hours, so huh? if there's a link or a resource I can go to, Instantly, because I may not have time to get a radio, get my iPod, and find my music. Mm -hmm. yeah. It may be, you know, Claudia drives back and forth to work. That may be Claudia's drive to work because it's on her iPod. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't close your eyes. Yeah. Oh, that's a good time. <laughs> too far. I love technology, but I think there's something to be said for teaching this without technology. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think your simple bringing of that little gong, mm. yeah. it was amazing to me how quickly that just said to me, Center. we're moving Center. in a different place. Yeah. And, and I think we love our technology and we do a great job of using it in Keras, but I, I'm almost leery to say let's put this on a video and use it on retreat. I think it's something we, we need to, as teams to know and understand and experience ourselves then to share it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I just think there's something to be said for that. Um, that you don't, because we it's that idea of prayer that we want to fill our prayer space with the perfect plant and the water piece and the music piece and the perfect setting. You don't need any of that to do the exam. Mm -hmm. You just need to be able to sit with it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a challenge for us. But I think, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm leery about saying let's put it on and use a, a thing because something beautiful about just the human voice and someone pacing it out properly. That's what I was, that, that's what I was feeling. It's, you know, it's that 
I mean, your voice is very, it's very yeah, nice yeah. to pray with, you know, yeah. first of all. But the way you worded things was also significant, I think. Mm -hmm. What it, mm -hmm. like, when you did that opening piece on Thanksgiving, wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, the light was already filling me before mm -hmm. you even said, you know. So, um, I think that's what I'm, I'm meaning, it, you know. Yeah, you don't want a, like, a, a <laughs> recipe, but just that, that good guided imagery in one sense. And some people pray well with that. And I think when people are first learning a prayer form like this, to have, you know. Sure. Yeah, I use an online one yeah. uh, <laughs> daily. So I think even though you know, yeah. you know, you yeah, know it, but it, it helps you. It's, you know, because yeah. it has nice music with it. it right. it's, you know. Yeah. But I, I know what you mean on retreat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. it's a great resource. Yeah. Yeah. Every good book has a movie, but we still read the book. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 My, 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 I'm, I'm, yeah. I was just going to say, in order, order for the team to pray together without having the leader actually leading it, um, uh, a, an audio of some sort or a video would help the leader be able to pray with the team rather than to lead the team. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it, um, it could be like um, Sister talked about doing it as part of the formation of like, the core yeah, team, but right, that right. is something that I, from personal experience, like it's pretty daunting to lead a meditation, like to, the idea of doing that, but it, it really is not, um, it's not impossible, it's not something that we couldn't teach young adults to do, like so I think somebody from the, the young adult team could yeah, absolutely. learn to do that over the course of, I mean, yeah. It wouldn't take that long, but over the three or four months that, you, that you're preparing them, and it could, it's mm -hmm. profound to be able to, to share that with your peers, too. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. A couple of thoughts. I don't think it's an either or. It's, a all, it's an right. all. Yeah. 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 Um, there are different, different modality. Because this can be used anywhere, there may be a modality in which the tech, uh, technological piece is mediating if I can plug it into my car or whatever. There are other times where I think we all experienced that in here in this group, and there was a dynamic that occurred here because we sensed one another praying it too. There's something about that, and there's something about the live voice. So when can you do that? I mean, it's, so it's not either or. It's like, what are the situations where Karis gets together where this this could be reenacted in this kind of a format because that would be really helpful rather than me having done a, a PowerPoint here I could have done that I could have found one of those things and just turned that on and sat with you rather than kind of leading it but I think you felt a different dynamic so it's um, that's good and that means that um, in your Karis places where you all come from what would be the venues where this kind of thing would be a, a better thing a better choice uh, because it's just human beings sitting together without the technology when it's the technology after Paul. And the spirit works with the leader too, I've, I've uh -huh. found from... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I was praying it with you and mm -hmm. I, uh, hopefully you heard it, heard me doing that through my voice, mm -hmm. you know. And also the, the other thing was I did integrate the social... I noticed that. Okay. <laughs> See, the, and that's what, I mean, I think it's just, sometimes it's just that simple is to add the, the thing about the world um, uh, in terms of the feeling uh, to just share with you real briefly there was a wonderful person yesterday on the plane that helped uh, two women take down their um, big things yes. from the, the cart and he impressed me I was sitting there waiting like you usually you see these rows coming and you know you were going to wait a little <laughs> while but I saw this guy do that and when I came to I was reviewing my day as I was doing this he came to my mind and that feeling, and when I, I think I said at this point, uh, express uh, what is uh, gratitude or concern or sorrow or what are you in love with, you know? And um, in that uh, uh, focusing on feeling in myself or in the world, it's like um, um, if you put the world in there, from that feeling, what I was thinking in my own silence here was, I want everybody to be like him, you know? So that's making the, the prayer more social. It's not, you know, just about what am I getting out of this. Um, so that, that feeling of uh, how lovely he was, really, in, in doing that kind of activity, I, I was just saying, in my desire at the end of this, for me, it was like, you know, we need more people like this. I want to be more like this. 
we need people in the world like this, not people who are, who are just here for me. So I think if you were, if you throw the, those little words in here, you can make it more socially conscious that it's not just an, an interiority that is pressure. <coughs> Um, we're nearing the end of our time, and I just want to cover these uh, points um, that are here. It's, I've made a few of them all, but I want to highlight some of them, uh, including the last one. Um, I put the image of God, whenever I talk about prayer, I, I usually include this thing. Um, don't, when we had the board on the other side and I listed those prayer forms, when people approach prayer, it seems to me that often the first question that comes up is how. How do I pray? You know, uh, we're going to have a talk on prayer, and what most people would expect it's going to be how to, you know, what, what are prayer forms and how do you do it. I think there's an antecedent question who am I praying to? And that's really important because if I have a God who's a judge, who's a scorekeeper in the sky, who's uh, a God of wrath, it doesn't make any difference whether I'm doing examen or Lexio Divina meditation or Lexio Divina contemplation or whatever prayer form I'm going to do. If that's the image of God, it, the prayer form in the how to is not going to make much of a difference because that God is going to keep showing up um, even in the examen prayer. So just a reminder about that, and that opens up a whole other set of questions and lectures probably. Um, and, but. Um, in your work with Karis, um, notice um, in your discussions with people when you have discussions on prayer that might be worthy of a discussion to talk about, or if not to talk about head on, to be listening for what you suspect are people's images of God um, and how those images might be transformed, if they need to be transformed. Now, some people just grew up with a God of love, you know, which I think is the gospel that Jesus preached. But there are some people who have um, pretty stringent um, deities there um, that I think violate the first commandment, thou shalt not have false gods before me, because the God who revealed God's self through Jesus in particular is a God of utter compassion like the father and the prodigal son. But you get my point that the image of God is awfully important. It seems to me when we're talking about prayer, who am I praying to? And um, uh, it's not enough just to say, okay, if you've got that kind of God, get rid of it. It's, because it's not that easy. Um, this, uh, the God of wrath, God of severe judgment that a lot of people live with has um, got deep roots in, oftentimes in personal history, family of origin issues, uh, religious leader issues, all kinds of things. But um, that these kinds of prayer then can um, can help to transform those images over time. And the great gift of spiritual direction and doing spiritual direction with people, or even in being the group in the groups that you're in in Karis, that as you get to know people over many years, the beauty of seeing an image of God transformed from a really um, wrathful one to a God who is now loving and knows the person personally knows the person personally. This is divine revelation. Jesus called people by their name and got to know them personally and hoped that they would join the mission. So it's not just about me, but you know, it is about moving out as well. But the, that's divine revelation of the self-communicating God uh, throughout Hebrew scriptures and throughout the New Testament was a God that got to know people. <laughs> got to know Moses, he got to know Abraham, he got to know Miriam and Esther, etc., etc. got to know Mary, a little virgin in a small town. God deals directly with people, and if there are negative images of God, they can be transformed over time. And I think, you know, when we do the examine with our teams, I mean, just a little side note on team formation, that I think we can hear these images come up sometimes, you know, um, and before people even give their talks. And I think, to me, again, the examine is so helpful in our team. Like, I mean, I had a guy, I remember he, his image of God was benevolent dictator. <laughs> and I kept thinking, and he was sharing this in his talk, and it would come up in our prayer. And, you know, I think that's, again, where this tool for what we're doing and what we're here about is so helpful, you know, because even as we're helping our team members, you know, share their story, we can kind of, as ministers, be aware of some of these images that you're going, well, I don't know if you should be really up there talking about, but yeah. God is 
benevolent dictator because that's really contradictory and we were able to unpack it and kind of and the team helped with that so um, anyway again I think that's where some of the things you have up here that I'm sure you're going to talk more about is why this is such a key piece I think of formation mm -hmm. for us so yeah it's just a very, very important part of it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and how one deals with it, again, there may be times when one can deal with it a little bit more head on, but it's usually more subtle. It's usually putting us alongside of that the contradiction. Well, if you've got a dictator God, what do you do? What, what's your reflection on this God who's the father and the prodigal son? Right. And, Jesus, you know, and put that alongside this, you know. Yeah, do you. Put alongside, you know, Jesus' uh, utter compassion for sinners of the stories there and put that up there you know alongside of it so that you get the the um, uh, pro and the con and, the, and mm -hmm. hopefully over time um, that God of love um, can get through you know it's part of the art of formation the art uh, there's an art to it and, mm -hmm. Of, of working with and teasing out that is not just that you've got a dictator God change that. That would be it's dictating. To recognize that. <laughs> yeah. right. Recognizing that is important and then That's say yeah. do, you, do you desire something different and do you see something different when you look at Jesus, you know, precisely why he came, I think it seems to me, is to reveal the face of God. And I frankly I think you died for it. I think that there were people in this culture that just didn't want that God to be mm -hmm. the God. They wanted a God they who, wanted judge for who did laws, follow these prescriptions, and you'll be fine. Jesus' idea of God was probably a little too free for some people in power. Not all. Joseph of Arimathea was a Pharisee. You know, um, uh, Zacchaeus, all these people were Jew Jewish people. But, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, th I think uh, the significant people who were, had power didn't like that. That's a God who's a little too free, a little too loving. You without sin cast the first stone. I'm sorry? You without sin cast yeah. the first stone. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, this is very important, and Ham brings this out somewhat, but I really want to emphasize that this prayer form, maybe more than the others, can really be the devil's playground especially with a scrupulous conscience. In mm -hmm. fact, if someone is really scrupulous, I probably won't even give this prayer. I'd rather give a Lexio Divina meditation that keeps presenting this loving God alongside their scrupulosity. You can see where this might go, this kind of prayer form could go if it's more examination of conscience oriented, even if I'm using the language consciousness. For some people who are very scrupulous in their consci consciousness even, um, this kind of prayer could get very focused on me mm -hmm. and not at all on God. This whole prayer should be focused on God, mm -hmm. do you know, which is why I think when I started it out, I think I made that clear. Um, at one point in uh, my step three here, what does God want me to see about my day yesterday? Not just what do I want to see about it, because if, uh, if I tend to dump on myself, I go through this kind of exam, and it, it's going to be a dumping process. I'm, I'm going to do not, nothing but dump on myself. The whole point of this is to see, where was God yesterday? What does God want me to see about yesterday or this morning? What does God want me to see, to see about it and to know about this experience? So it really needs to have its focus. This uh, examine awareness needs to be focused on God. What is God doing in my life? Okay? And to say that, um, uh, again, the, the danger of this could be uh, a kind of self-scrutiny that every time I do this prayer, I just end up feeling bad about myself. Yeah. And I say, watch out, because that's yeah. not what it's intended to be. It's intended to be, where do I need God? You know, how is God working in my life? Uh, the connection of the uh, awareness exam with ongoing discernment and the help of a journal in this. Um, uh, George Ashenbrenner, whose name is mentioned in this article, has written a lot on the consciousness exam. I think it's the phrase that he uses for it. He's a Jesuit. He's written a lot on examination or the exam. He makes this point that he really thinks that the exam it, it is actually a form of discernment. And stop and think about it. If you're doing this every day, you are in a process of discerning your life. And um, so to make that, connect, in fact, I think that uh, probably that thinking about the exam and prayer really points to the difference of, of why we've changed the words. 
Because if you just have examination of conscience, you're not talking about the ongoing discernment of your life. You're talking about just focusing, focusing on moral behavior. Examine of consciousness that I'm stopping to, to be aware of what? Of noticing where God has been in the concrete circumstances of my life. If I'm doing this in a patterned, regular way with regularity, I'm actually in the process of discernment. Where, where are the patterns of where God is and where God is not? Journals sometimes help this um, and can sometimes hinder it. If a journal really becomes a burden, I'm not sure how helpful it is. But um, a lot of people uh, keep journal notes just by doing bullet points now. You know, um, to, so to have, a, you know, maybe if I actually practice the exam and, and have a journal, just to put the date down and two bullet points. You know, and then at the end of the week, as I look over the bullet points, or at the end of a month, maybe I do a monthly review. I start to see where the patterns are of where I uh, find God and where I don't. So um, if that's helpful to you, I recommend it. Um, and some of you probably already do it and know the benefits of journaling. But for those of you who don't, think about that. But I would say don't make it an assignment. When it starts to become an assignment, uh, we, most of us are pretty tired by the end of the day. It just adds another burden. So, you know, and again, electronics, maybe you want to put this online. You've got a file that is your exam and file, and uh, you, do, you do a date book kind of thing. And it's just a matter of two bullet points, you know, this is where I found God. And then on Saturday morning, just uh, if you want to review the week, and, uh, you know, you have uh, 12 bullet points from Monday through Saturday. Um, it, that point has been made. Uh, this does need to be practiced with regularity, or it's not going to be that effective if I only do it kind of sporadically uh, and find at the end of a month I've done it twice. Um, it's the, the benefits, uh, such as they are, uh, to be reaped can only happen if it's done regularly. And then to, um, uh, what, I'm sorry, your name in the blue dress? Becky. Becky already raised this question. Um, I think. Uh, in a thorough going way we all need to be more conscious in all of our prayer life in our prayer forms and as Karis members who um, are leaders for some of this to always be thinking about the social dimension and again as someone said the more I integrate it into my own prayer life the more it's going to come out of my mouth naturally if I'm integrating the social dimension of, of things and a simple way to do that, as I said, is to just add it into the wording of things and I think at the ending of things. When I'm moving out of a prayer period, um, to just say, um, this is what, how it's touched me. Now, what desires, and I, I love that word. Maybe that's a way of getting at the social thing so that the social thing doesn't seem like a, an assignment or an add-on. If this has produced this desire in me, what's my desire for the world? I, I long for the world to be inclusive not exclusive. I long for the world to be on fire with the passion that I felt in this last 10 minutes. I long for the world to confess its sins. I long for people to be honest. I long for politicians and all. If I, if I felt like I wasn't honest today and that kind of came up, well, you know, I long for, oh, we all need it. You know? So, I mean, I think if I'm conscientious about where I can add that dimension and to do it from desire, What's your, just to have a prayer period where you say, what's my, what do I desire for the world today? Not just for me, I want it. You know, sometimes I read the headlines in the newspapers. It creates great desire. Newspaper headlines should create great desires in us for the social dimension of things. You know, when I read about hunger, when I read about dishonesty, when I read about corruption, it should create great desires in me. Well, the prayer, the substance of prayer should be the desire but it, I think it's right there, um, the social dimension. I don't think we notice it, and I don't think we add it, because we yeah. tend to think of prayer and the spiritual life as just me and God. And I think the way out of it is just to stop thinking that way, <laughs> just start to open the doors um, and add the words and add the experiences that make it a social question. But if, if I can do that from desire, not just from kind of uh, you know heady, um, a requirement that I ought to add this to my prayer, really do it from what am I longing for for our world? What am I longing for for people in need? And to work it from my desire, then I think it'll, it has a chance of getting better integrated. Yes? Father, then, from my perspective, that changes our attitude, our 
attitude of going to mass, check the box, Sunday done, change the oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I agree. Mm -hmm. I want to be conscious of time. Yeah, I think we're out of time. Um, and you've got other things on your schedule. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, thanks a lot, Steve. Yeah, sure. This is really uh, helpful for me, and it's good to have all this context. Okay.